My name is David Baker and I preach for the 8th Street Church of Christ in Mesa, Arizona. I hold in my hand the Bible. It's the Word of God. In the Bible we find the answers to the great questions of life. Where we came from, where we're headed, and why we're here. We'd like to explore these questions and the answers that you find in the Bible with you at 6.30 in the morning on ION TV. Please join us, won't you? The shades of night till Jesus came to me, and with the sunlight of his love bid all my darkness flee. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today, sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin, I have had the sunlight of his love within. Hello, my name is Jay Borg, and I'm a part-time evangelist and a partner with the Church of Christ located at 1551 East 8th Street in Mesa, Arizona. Our meeting times are on Sunday at 9.30 and 10.30 in the morning, and again at 6 p.m. And on Wednesday, we meet for Bible study at 7 p.m. I may be reached at 480-981-9794. My email address is jborg at cox.net. Our website address is cfcmesa.com. Welcome to Bible Truths. Today's lesson is titled, Christ, the Chief Cornerstone. I'd like to introduce this lesson by reading from the book of Ephesians in chapter 2, starting in verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been made near by the blood of Christ, dropping down to verse 16, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. What verses 14 and 15 said basically is he took the old law, the law of Moses, out of the way so Jew and Gentile could be united one in Christ, in the body of Christ. That's what he's saying here. In verse 17, continuing, And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Here we have a passage of scripture that says that Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, and you might ask, well, what does that mean, Christ being the chief cornerstone? Well, basically, the definition of a cornerstone is the chief corner of a building which everything else is measured from after the foundation is laid. So it's a very critical part of the building. In this case, the idea is how all Christians are joined together in Christ is through Jesus Christ and His sacrifice for our sins. But it also talks about the idea of the foundation. Well, what about the foundation? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, in verse 10, it states, According to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. And another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now you might be confused about this because it says here it says that the Apostle Paul was one he was the one that laid the foundation, and another one builds on it. But we need to understand what this what that means in context in the scripture. First of all, this passage says that no other foundation can anyone lay, which is in Christ, Jesus Christ. Well, let's look at some other passages that help explain this a little bit. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 26, 
Jesus is giving instructions to his apostles right before he dies for our sins. Let's see what it says. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things that I said to you. So, Jesus is going to send the Holy Spirit via the Father. Basically, the help of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send, He will send it in Jesus' name. And he's going to, they're going to teach Him all things. And John 16, verse 13, adds this, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. Speaking of, to the apostles only, For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Now, if you have some confusion about Paul building on the foundation, but if you that you understand that the Holy Spirit was sent by the Father in Jesus' name, by his authority, and that it was, he's to declare what is of Christ and declare it to the apostles, then you understand that basically the foundation is Christ and Christ alone. It's not through men, it's through the inspired apostles, which was insp they were inspired by the Holy Spirit, which was given through Jesus. Which also makes sense too when you look at Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 2, which says, in these last days, Speaking of how God spoke to people at various different times and different ways, he says it's spoken to us by his Son, that is Christ. So, in the New Testament, that is given to us by Jesus. So, the foundation, the chief cornerstone, is Christ. So, why is that important that he is the chief cornerstone? Well, let's look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16 through 18. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence, in other words, first place or superior in importance. So he created, everything was created through him and for him. And he is the head of the body, the church. Not the Pope. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. That's what this passage says. Why? That he may have preeminence in what? All things. Not some things. All things. He is the first place and superior in importance in all things. It's kind of like what John chapter 14 verse 6 summarizes where it says, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. In other words, he's everything to us, according to the scripture. So what else does the scripture say? Well, in Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus says that he has all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. If Jesus has all authority, how much do we have? Well, the answer would be zero, unless he gives us that authority. And the only place Jesus would give us any authority, obviously, based on what we've said so far, is through the scriptures and the scriptures only, alone. And that's important to understand. So what else does the scripture say about Jesus, about our Lord? Well, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, it says this, He who is the blessed and only potentate, which means mighty, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And the nature of kings is to give law. And Christ is no different here. He's giving law. We have the Old Testament and we have the New Testament. The Old Testament was law to the Jews only. And the New Testament is law. But that's law to all people. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 15 starting, it says this about the new covenant. For this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death, 
for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also be a necessity be the death of the tester. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the tester lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. Here we have a passage of scripture that talks about the new covenant. And it took the shedding of Christ's blood for it to be in effect. And it's kind of like this. We're all familiar probably with the idea of last will and testament. Well, the New Testament is kind of like that. Jesus is giving us his last will and testament, in a matter of speaking, where he died for all men, and yet all men are under it. Even if people don't say that they are, they are under it, regardless if they recognize it or not. So it's important to realize that. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, it says this, Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors. We are to submit to every ordinance. And the government is in place as a result of what God has ordained. He has ordained government to regulate people today. Now even the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 21 that Paul was under the law of Christ. That's important to recognize because some people say the New Testament is not a book of law. Well, what they don't understand is the New Testament often said, uses terms like commandment. Um, it uses things like ordinance. It uses testament. It uses various different terms. But it all has to do with law and regulating us. We're supposed to be following those things. And here's a passage that people use sometimes to try to teach that. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, it says, There is no law, but it says, it's speaking about, the, it's in the context of the fruit of the Spirit. Things like kindness, gentleness, and self-control. It's talking about all the great characteristics that Christians should have. Why would you regulate that? from the standpoint when they're already doing what's right. That's the idea and the intent of the passage. Not to say there's no law at all. And also sometimes people go to Romans 6 verse 14 and 15 and say things like, well, it says it's not, we're not under law, but we're under grace. Well, the context of the passage is that we're not under the law of Moses, but we're under grace. Well, why is it called grace? Well, in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, says this, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. It's teaching that the grace of God has appeared to all men. It's, in other words, it's for all men. And it tells us that we're supposed to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, and that we should live seriously about what's right and godly. When? In the present age. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, not years past, not years in the future, but today, every day, for the Lord, that we're supposed to be following Jesus and what He says. And in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, it adds this, that Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. So if you don't obey him, he's not the author of eternal salvation. In other words, we would not have any hope of eternal salvation unless we obey Jesus. And we need to recognize that he's a lawgiver. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 22 starting, it talks about comparing Moses and Jesus, and how they're like one another. In verse 22, For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet will be utterly destroyed from among the people. And yes, all the prophets from Samuel and from those to follow, as many have spoken, have foretold of these days. 
we need to understand that we are under Jesus. That all the Old Testament basically said it, and the New Testament basically says it. If we read His Word, we'll see that. In the Old Testament, in Jeremiah 31 through 34, it speaks about changing the covenant from the old law, the law of Moses, to the law of Christ. And that is quoted as fulfilled in Hebrews chapter 8, and verse, starting in verse 7, where it quotes that passage in Jeremiah. For it talks about, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been made, thought for a second. Because being finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in, in the day that when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And none of them shall teach his neighbor, none his brother, saying, No, Lord, for all shall know me, from the least and the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and lawless days I will remember no more. In that he says, A new covenant he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. In other words, the New Testament has replaced the Old Testament as a law that governs all people. And the Old Testament was only specifically originally for the Jews. That's not to say that there aren't things that we need to understand under the Old Testament. We do, because many times it's quoted in the New. So we need to understand in context what those things is talking about, because it's some of what the Old has been brought over to the New. That being said, we need to understand that Jesus, when He came, He gave law. In Matthew chapter 5, and verses 21 and 22, he quotes the Old Testament, actually the sixth commandment of the ten, where he says, You have heard what is said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says you fool shall be in da danger of the hellfire. Here we have a passage of Scripture contrasting the old law with the new law. And he's making it stricter. And at the end of the sermon, it's called the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 7, verse 28, starting, he says this, When he ended these sayings, that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. In other words, Jesus has all authority. We can see it spoken about directly and indirectly and specifically in context in Jesus speaking and other people speaking about it. So if Jesus has all authority, he's king of kings, and he's the lawgiver, what does that mean to us? Well, it sounds like we better pay better close attention to what scripture says and what he says. So what else does the scripture say about his word, about this New Testament? Timothy chapter 1 Verse 13, it says, Hold fast the pattern of sound words, which you have heard from me in faith and in love, which are in Christ Jesus. We need to hold fast to the pattern. The New Testament is described as a pattern, one that we should not deviate in. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says this, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a work who does not need to be ashamed, Rightly dividing the word of truth. In other words, there's a right way to divide it, and there's a wrong way to divide it. In other words, you just can't, you can't handle the word of God any way you choose. You need to be careful about handling it. It's kind of like the idea of, if somebody gives you instructions about something, and they're paying you to do it, you need to follow it closely, because they're paying you to do it. Well, Jesus paid a very high price for us that we might have a hope to be with him forever. We may need to pay attention to what he says. And we're not honoring that person unless we do pay attention to what he says. Well, what else does the scripture say? Well, in John chapter 12, verse 48, it suggests that we need to follow his word closely. 
It says, He who rejects me and does not receive my words, as Jesus' words is speaking of, has that which judges him. The word I have spoken will judge him in the last day. And in, in John chapter 14, verse 23, he adds this, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. This says we need to keep his words. Well, there are some people that claim that they know Jesus, and yet, don't keep his words. What does the scripture say about them specifically? Well, in 1 John, the epistle of John, chapter 2, verse 3, it says this, Now by this we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him, ought himself also to walk, just as he walked. This is clear that we need to keep his commandments. And the scripture speaks about if we don't, we're considered a liar. And what does the scripture say about liars that don't repent? Well, Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 says this, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers and idolaters, and all liars have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This is a way of describing hell. And I don't want anybody to go there. So we need to be honest with ourselves. We need to be looking closely at God's word. He loves us and wants us to obey him because it's for our own good. Now, when we think about Jesus has all authority, and he's the king of kings, and he's lawgiver, and he tells us to closely follow these things, these alone make Jesus worthy of following him and great honor. But what else does the scripture say about our Lord and Savior? Well, in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 6, speaking about God at the end of the verse, it says, Hallelujah, for the Lord omnipotent, which means all-powerful, reigns. He's all-powerful. And in Colossians chapter 1 verse 16, as this, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. He's, he's so powerful, he created everything. And everything was created through him and for him and by him. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it speaks this about Jesus. For the word of God is living and powerful. Now, Jesus is described as the word in the scriptures, is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the hearts. In other words, Jesus knows what we're thinking. He knows what we're all thinking. He knows what our motives are. He knows us better than even we know ourselves sometimes. And yet, we need to be giving him his honor. What else does the scripture say? Well, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, it speaks about him healing all kinds of sicknesses and diseases. In Luke chapter 9, verse 6, it says he healed everywhere. He's the master healer. He's the master physician. He is the cure for our woes in this life. He's the cure that we can be with him forever. That certainly makes him worthy of honor. But what else does the scripture say about our Lord and Savior? In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, speaking about Jesus' character, he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made him of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on, on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
This is important that we understand that. We also have the example of him washing the disciples' feet right before he died, the apostles, that is. And he humbled himself to do that. This is our Lord and Savior and King of Kings doing that for us as an example showing how much he loved us. Why would we not want to seek after him? And in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, that's why he came, to seek and save the lost and for those disciples of his to do that very thing. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, he says, Jesus Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, did not revile in turn. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteousness, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. It speaks about his perfect and ultimate sacrifice that we needed to have for our sins, so we have a chance of forgiveness of sins. It also speaks about his perfect sacrifice, that it made it possible. And Christians ought to walk just as he walked, as we just read in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. So to conclude this lesson, Jesus Christ deserves to be honored because he's the King of Kings. He's all-powerful and all-knowing. He gave us a perfect example to follow. He gave a perfect sacrifice for our sins. And we have a chance of eternal life. And we have access through Christ. Ephesians 2.18 And if you aren't a Christian, will you honor him by doing what he says and become one? If you are a Christian but you haven't been faithful, will you honor him by repenting of your sins and asking forgiveness? Let's honor Christ like he says. Thank you for listening and we invite you to listen again sometime the same time, same station, next week. Thank you so much for your kind attention. I wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me, and with the sunlight of his love bid all my darkness flee. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today, sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin, I have had the sunlight of his love within. Though clouds may gather in the sky and billows round me roll, however dark the world may be, I've sunlight in my soul. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away. My name is David Baker and I preach for the 8th Street Church of Christ in Mesa, Arizona. I hold in my hand the Bible. It's the Word of God. In the Bible we find the answers to the great questions of life. Where we came from, where we're headed, and why we're here. We'd like to explore these questions and the answers that you find in the Bible with you at 6.30 in the morning on ION TV. Please join us, won't you?